Well, howdy varmints. In this video, I'll show you an entire month of fermentation in a matter of minutes via time-lapse photography. You'll see experimental data that correlates pH to fermentation rates and stay tuned till the end where I'll show you how I turn this into this. And welcome to Open Source Distilling, where time-honored tradition meets modern day technology. As a homebrew guy, I'll be exploring home distilling with a fresh perspective, challenging well-held distilling traditions, and hopefully making some improvements along the way. If that's something that you're interested in, please smash that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so you won't miss any future videos. If you would like to see the recipe for the sugar wash that we're fermenting, links to the previous video in the description down below. There's a lot of things that surprised me during the making of this video. As a homebrew guy, I never had to really think of pH very often. We've got great water here, and with all grain homebrewing, it just always seemed to take care of itself. And after speaking with Silly Psycho, over in the Firewater subreddit, uh, he really helped me understand some of the differences between all grain homebrewing and fermenting a bunch of sugar wash. So let's start with looking at my experimental data. Link down below to my blog post if you want to see it in more detail. Now, please note I am uh, fermenting four six gallon batches at the same time, but I'm only filming and taking readings from one of them because I'm one lazy southern son of a bitch. In the first column, we have the date. In the next column, we have the specific gravity. And in the third column, I took the derivative of the specific gravity readings to get the rate of change of specific gravity. And I like to think of that as the rate of sugar consumption. In the fourth column, we have pH readings. And I've excluded readings from my old inaccurate expired pH testing strips. Where we do see pH readings in the data table, they are from newly purchased non-expired pH test strips, uh, affiliate link down below. The last column is where I recorded events uh, that took place during the fermentation process. So I've plotted uh, this data into three graphs, uh, one graph being the specific gravity readings, another graph, uh, the derivative of those specific gravity readings, and the last graph is the pH readings themselves. And on the graphs, you'll see some markings, uh, diamond and multiple dots. The diamond is the uh, yeast and nutrient addition I did. And then the dots are gonna be a teaspoon of baking soda each to adjust the pH. Up above, we have the graphs. To my right, we're gonna have the time-lapse photography in the frame over there. And in the TV set, uh, we're gonna have a close-up of the water surface of the fermenter itself. So let's start by looking at the first eight days of activity. You can see there's some bubbling in the airlock and water vapor pulsing. Uh, the graph shows a decrease in the specific gravity, which is great, it's what we expect, but the rate of sugar consumption is on a downward trend and that's not so great. At this point, I haven't yet received my new test strips, uh, so right now there is no accurate pH reading to, to show you guys. By the end of eight days, the sugar wash only had a specific gravity of 1.055, and that's not so great because eight days have passed by and only approximately 20% of the sugar has been consumed. This is not the result I'm looking for. Uh, and inside, I'm having a hissy fit reckoning my reasoning for a sluggish fermentation is that I must have grossly underpitched the yeast. And in homebrew, if you don't pitch enough yeast, you'll just get a stuck fermentation like 
what I feel I've got going on right now. So I did some research and I found a post on the home distilling forum where uh, they said at 1.070 sugar wash uh, it should get about 24 grams of yeast and I only put five in here originally. I booted up my beer smith which is home brewing software and I doctor up, doctored up my sugar wash and beer smith said I needed about 16 grams of yeast. I did a yeast addition to my glass fermenter to get up to 24 grams of yeast. I did additions to the other fermenters to get 16 grams, 18 grams, and 20 grams respectfully. I thought that spreading out the yeast additions like that would show the difference between the home distiller forum recommendation and the beersmith recommendation. I thought that the optimal pitch rate would be somewhere between those two recommendations. At the same time, I dumped in the remainder of the 12 grams of superfood yeast nutrient. I didn't add any more yeast nutrient moving forward. One of the most fascinating things about this whole experiment was how much activity I saw after adding the additional yeast and the yeast nutrient. Boy, was I happy when I saw all that activity in the fermenter. I saw lots of things moving around and mixing. I saw yeast blowing through my blow-off tube, which is a great sign of a vigorous fermentation, and lots of action going on. And pay attention to the end of the clip as the airlock slows down and almost stops bubbling completely. This portion of the video is two days, and to my surprise, the specific gravity only moved by 0.001. Disappointingly, practically no sugar had been fermented. The graph showed little change in specific gravity, a continuing downward trend in the rate of sugar consumption, and we finally get our first reliable pH reading. Despite all the visual indications that fermentation was taking place, my experimental data showed the exact opposite. My three sheets to the wind is my hydrometer broken. I'm twirling my mustache here, wondering what to do next. Just want to take a second to say that I was so focused on yeast and yeast nutrients and so stuck in my beer brewing ways that I had forgotten about pH. I even took uh, pH readings with my new test strips and the reading was a three and that is extremely low. But it, I didn't clue into the fact that I was having an issue because uh, I was so focused on the yeast. The answer to my issue was staring me in the face, but I didn't see it. So I hopped on the internet and I did some more research and I found that some people were getting stuck fermentations because of their pH being too low, with an optimal pH being somewhere between three and a half and, and five. I scoured my apartment and I found an unopened box of baking soda and I dropped a teaspoon into each fermenter and the very next morning I was welcomed by millions of little bubbles in my fermenter. Things had changed and fermentation had definitely taken off. It was like riding a freshly branded cow at a hootenanny. Pay attention to the bubbling airlock. Although there isn't massive amounts of surface activity in the fermenter, like we saw during the uh, yeast addition and nutrient addition, uh, we do see significant airlock activity and a different kind of, of surface activity. In the graphs, we see pH spike up, uh, specific gravity sharply turns downwards, and the rate of sugar consumption shoots up. And these are all great signs that fermentation is happening. Over the next three weeks, specific gravity starts to level out as in the rate of sugar consumption goes on a downward trend as all the sugar is depleted from the sugar wash and that's to be expected. 
I can also see that I did more baking soda additions along the way and that the pH spikes up with each baking soda addition. Towards the end, fermentation is in its final stages and I uh, waited until the data showed that fermentation had stopped and then I took a specific gravity readings from all my fermenters. Now, bless my heart, and to my surprise, this video is just full of surprises, all fermenters had the same specific gravity reading. And that's an adjusted reading of 0 0.994, suggesting that any amount of pasture red yeast over 16 grams made no difference to the final fermentables at all. They all finished at the same time. In my last video, I said that I underpitched the yeast by adding only 5 grams, but I'm not so sure about that now. It's quite possible that 5 grams of yeast is enough, provided that the proper pH is maintained throughout the fermentation and that they have proper nutrition. More testing will be done in future videos to determine what a reasonable pitch rate is for a sugar wash. I am confident that I should not be adding more than 16 grams of yeast to future batches. Knowing a lot about homebrew doesn't mean squat when it comes to sugar washes. They are their own beast onto themselves. They require special considerations that are different than anything else I have brewed in the past. They are super high in readily available carbohydrates. They don't have any sort of natural pH buffer and they only contain the nutrients that you add, resulting in a situation far from what nature intended. Now, shout out again to Silly Psycho from the Firewater subreddit for his suggestions he used calcium carbonate instead of baking soda, citing that it will dissolve over time and will keep the pH from spiking up and down as it did when I added the baking soda. Odin, the founder of iStill, has said to keep the pH at about 5 for neutrals and about 3.5 to 4 for richer tasting spirits. I will shoot for a pH of 5 during my next fermentation round. To accomplish this, I will be trying calcium carbonate. I'm going to crush up some oyster shells, because why not? I'm going to try baking soda again for reference, and I'm going to make a citric acid buffer solution, which I'll create from citric acid and caustic soda. I may also try the 5.2 pH buffer that's often used in homebrew. The final steps in my fermentation process are to clear the wash using fining agents. My friend, Nacho Libre, will help us through this process. Nacho Libre is a simple man with a simple name, hoping he doesn't trigger any of you kids out there. We're all just trying to have a good time. This is a two-part fining process using Kisasol in Chattosan. I'm using about 10 milliliters of Kisasol and about 40 milliliters of Chattosan per six gallon batch. I put in 10 mils of Kisasol and gently stir it without uh, disturbing the yeast cake on the bottom of the fermenter. As per the instructions on the bottle, Nacho Libre waited an hour before gently stirring in the 40 milliliters of chato sand. From the time-lapse footage, we see how quickly the yeast drops out of suspension. This clip is four days, but most of the yeast drops out in a matter of hours. I took some footage in the end so you can see just how clear this really is. It's clear like water. I also put some samples in the fridge, and the yeast eventually did cold crash out as well. Now, the flavor profile of the final product, the sugar wine, is very neutral. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of flavor, it smells slightly yeasty, and has a faint bit of tartness to it, but not very much at all. Considering that things did not go perfectly during the fermentation process, I think the sugar wash tastes outstanding. This was a humbling experiment. I will never again do a sugar wash fermentation without paying close attention to the pH. As a brewer, I want my little yeast babies to grow up fast and strong. And a big part of that 
is having the right balance of pH through the fermentation process. In the next video, we'll be taking the sugar wine, running it through stripping runs, and taking those low wines we collect and putting them through a spirit run. We're also going to do a round of tasting through the collected spirits to see what we're going to keep and what we're going to throw away. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends, hit that like button, and if you haven't already, smash that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so you don't miss any future videos. Hope you're having a good day, and I love you all very, very much.